socioeconomic status. And any apparent link between socioeconomic status and health is spurious. There is, I have to say, virtually no evidence to support this model. Uh, we do have very clear evidence from birth cohort studies that downward social mobility cannot explain the social gradient in disease, health and disease we see in adulthood. In other words, the idea that sick children end up in lower social positions and healthy children end up in higher social positions has some validity, but the effect is quite small and cannot explain the social gradient in adulthood. We have now been looking at various genetic markers that could explain social class differences and have yet to come up with one. The APOE type, for example, in our data shows the 4-4 variant is no different by where you are in the hierarchy. So there's very little support for this idea. There must be some role here. If genes, genetic endowment is related to intelligence, as it must be, and intelligence is related to upward mobility, then you can see some role for genes. In our Whitehall data, we can show that the social gradient in health and disease in adult life cannot be explained by intelligence, because we've measured cognitive function. So, there's, while this has superficial plausibility, it's unlikely to be the major explanation for the social gradient in health and disease. So the second class of explanation, so the first is where you came from, the second is what you do. And I've said round up the usual suspects. When people think about inequalities in health, the first thing they think about is medical care. Uh, it must be that people lower in the hierarchy have worse medical care. Or if they get over that set of thoughts, they then think it must be that poor people behave badly. They smoke, drink to excess, eat bad food, can't be trusted to do physical activity. It's all down to their bad behavior. I think neither of those is an adequate explanation. If we look back at the first Whitehall study, uh, this is CHD, coronary heart disease, mortality of 25-year follow-up, and that's the social gradient adjusted for age. And here we've adjusted for smoking, systolic blood pressure, plasma cholesterol concentration height, and blood sugar. And you can see that we explain about a quarter of the social gradient in mortality. So there's a clear social gradient after we've taken these standard risk factors and height and blood sugar into account. What about medical care? Well, one of the striking findings is that we see social gradients in coronary heart disease and uh, physiological disturbance that we think are precursors for coronary disease in non-human primates. Uh, Robert Sapolsky has been studying baboons on the Serengeti uh, for some considerable time, and they, I must say, have disastrous medical care, um, very little access to uh, high-quality medical care facilities, these baboons, uh, but they don't differ according to status, and yet the high-status baboons uh, are better off. Similarly, Carol Shively's studies in rhesus macaques, uh, this is the degree of atherosclerosis in males, if you want to give a female as much atherosclerosis as a, as a male, then take out her ovaries. If, like me, you're a doctor who doesn't like the sight of blood uh, and don't want to take out her ovaries, then make her subordinate. Um, for intact females, this is dominant, these are subordinates, and the effect of being subordinate has almost as much impact on atherosclerosis as removal of the ovaries. And what you can show is that it's not disease that leads to subordination, but it's subordination that leads to disease by doing experiment of changing ranks. And coming back to Sapolsky's baboons, uh, this is HDL cholesterol in male baboons. Um, the uh, the um, low grade, sorry, the labels are strange. Um, this is the 
um, higher HDL cholesterols in the um, dominant baboons and lower HDL cholesterol in the subordinate baboons and um, the uncomfortable comparison between civil servants and baboons, we see similarly uh, high-grade civil servants have higher levels of HDL cholesterol than low-grade. But this, of course, raises a puzzle and a problem for me. If we see hierarchies in health in non-human primates, are they not inevitable? If wherever we see social animals and we see hierarchies and health follows that social hierarchy, perhaps there's nothing we could do about it. And my answer to that is compare species and compare circumstances. In fact, although we see hierarchies in virtually all non-human primate species, there are 150 different non-human primates and the consequences of hierarchies for health varies among species. And in fact, Robert Sapolsky and I are now doing a review uh, looking at the characteristics that determine whether hierarchy in non-human primates translates into worse health. Similarly, if we look across human societies with different circumstances, we find that the social gradient in health varies. So that it may be that hierarchies are inevitable, but the consequences of hierarchies for health depend on circumstances. And that leads me to the third part. Um, in addition to where you came from and what you do, it's what you have thrust upon you. It's the circumstances in which you live and work, the social determinants of health. What about money? If I talk about social circumstances, then it's reasonable to say, what about money? What about income? And I want to go through this. And the first is, if you have little money, absolute amount matters. If I go back to the northern uh, English city of York, a hundred years ago, this is mortality of children under one year of age. And they're classified by the poorest uh, middle working class or highest working class. And you can see that infant mortality varied from 173 per thousand live births to 247. In the best off area of York, the servant keeping class, infant mortality was still 94 per thousand live births. So you can see that poverty really mattered, but it's not just individual poverty, it's what poverty means for a whole community. And in fact, what poverty means for a whole community a hundred years ago was indeed poor conditions for having children, a lot of infection, uh, inadequate circumstances for birth, and so on. When we look a hundred years later, this is infant mortality per thousand live births in England and Wales in 2000. And 3.7, 3.6, this is social class of the father, uh, per thousand live births for the best off, and 8.1 for the worst off. So the worst off in England and Wales in 2000 is an order of magnitude better than the best off a hundred years earlier. For all intents and purposes, in the rich countries of the world, it's over. Material deprivation is no longer a major cause of illness. It's finished. It's done with. Social circumstances are really important, but when the worst off group has an infant mortality of 8.1 per thousand live births, uh, you can say that for all intents and purposes, we're not dealing now with absolute poverty. And we can see that once you get above a threshold, it works for a whole country. Income matters very little. These are for a series of countries uh, with gross domestic product in purchasing power parities in US dollars. So it's adjusting for purchasing power. And you can see these countries for varying from Cuba with a GDP at purchasing power of $5,000 up to the US with $34,000. And there's simply no relation between income of a country and life expectancy. Uh, Japan, life expectancy at birth 
81.3, um, running down here, Sweden, Spain, Switzerland, France, Greece, UK, Costa Rica, US. Uh, when I have shown these figures in the United States, people get very uncomfortable at the idea that life expectancy in the US is only 0.4 of a year ahead of that evil, evil regime in Cuba. Uh, how could that possibly be? I say, okay, well, let's not deal with Cuba. Let's deal with Costa Rica. Uh, and life expectancy is a year longer in Costa Rica with a GDP of purchasing power of $9,500 compared with the US. So once you get above, a country gets above a GDP of about $5,000, there's simply no relation between income and poverty, income and life expectancy. So that we've got to think about people's social circumstances in other ways. It's true within a country, if we classify people according to their income, that those with higher income have longer lives, but given that income doesn't seem to matter for a country above about $5,000, I think it's not the income that's important. It's the social position that's important. It's other things that go along with the income. And that leads me to the second, above material deprivation. It's how much you have relative to others. A rich man, said H.L. Mencken, is one who earns $100 more than his wife's sister's husband. These experiments have been done with American university students. Uh, the dollar experiment. You live in a society where the average income is $100,000 and your income is $125,000. Now consider a new situation. Average incomes are now $200,000 and your income is $175,000. In the two societies, the dollar has the same purchasing power. Which situation would you prefer? In other words, would you like to be 